Just uh, in terms of logistics about what to expect today, I'm going to give a brief presentation out trying to get us all on the same general footing. And can everyone hear me all right in the, the back? You're good. Okay. Once we're all on the same page, we have a, an all-star squad of uh, carbon use and removal experts here. We're going to go into panel discussion. But we hope that this is a, a conversation. And so don't hesitate to ask questions. Initially, feel free to ask sort of clarifying questions if things are not clear. And then we'll get into some uh, more discussion and dialogue questions with the second half of the day. So we're actually going to start with a, an art history quiz. Any art history majors in the audience? No? Art history and carbon capture? No. <laughs> so don't look at your phones. If you can uh, figure out who the, the painter is, we'll give you a prize. <laughs> Any ideas? Does anyone uh, know the beautiful pooch featured here in this painting? Cerberus. 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 There we go. That, that's what really matters. <laughs> it's, a, it's a William Blake painting. Uh, it's in the, the Tate over in London. But I show it because we at the Center for Carbon Removal are a bit of the Cerberus of nonprofits focused on carbon removal policy. We do a, a bit of a policy work on the R&D side and also work with uh, startups. We're standing up a, a technology accelerator out in the Bay Area. We're based in California, so spend a fair amount of our time working on California Sacramento policy, but mostly federal policy engagement. Um, we're a fairly new nonprofit organization, about three years old at this point, and, and our mission is really to accelerate the development of a full portfolio of carbon removal strategies. Everything from forests and soils on the natural side to technologies from direct air capture, but also including a lot of the pathways to net negative carbon emissions, which is where we'll be talking about today. So I think there are three main takeaways that are important for, for this conversation. The first is that when I was introduced to carbon capture a decade ago, the conversation was very different from where it was today that we are focused narrowly on essentially coal power plants, electricity generating units. Conversation is much broader now. And the second key point is that because that conversation is a lot broader, the progress is happening in, in many, what to me were unexpected places. So we're starting to see a lot of market traction, bipartisan policy support around converting carbon into valuable products, thinking about carbon differently and at different scales than we had envisioned carbon capture in the past. The other important thing to take away is the policy landscape is actually evolving very rapidly today at the federal level and beyond. And what we hope to communicate today is a, a brief uh, synopsis of what's happening in this space, where we see the developments, but also what we think the near future holds for the policy outlook in this space. Okay, onward. So to level set and set the table here, to the first point about what we're actually talking about today when we talk about carbon capture, it's a fairly broad portfolio of strategies. We're talking about capture from a wide range of sources. So this includes the traditional power plants, like coal, like natural gas, like biomass, but it also includes industrial sources where we're actually seeing some of the low hanging fruit in carbon capture today ethanol refineries, other types of fuel manufacturing, steel, cement, all of the heavy process emissions offer big opportunities. And third, direct air capture, essentially vacuuming CO2 directly from ambient air is also emerging as a new technology. Once you've captured the, the carbon, you then have to do something with it. And so whereas conventionally this has been the far right of just stick carbon underground geologic reservoir. There are lots of other opportunities that are emerging today. So you can also stick carbon underground, produce more oil. That's the lion's share of carbon utilization today, essentially turning carbon into value. But there are also these whole range of products from cements to plastics to chemicals to niche things like greenhouse 
uh, fertilization and, and so forth. So you can use CO2 for lots of different products. And th this whole field has started to recently emerge as a, a real option for capturing carbon. Pause there, any questions on scope of what we're talking about today? Yeah, so general question, will these slides be available at any point after? Yes, they will be. Happy to figure out how we can share them. Um, sign up if you want the slides. Okay. okay, so why are we doing this? It's a two part equation. The first is the climate story that without some sort of large carbon capture enterprise, the climate goals as we've imagined are more or less not possible. This is a, a figure from our paper last year in the journal Science. Basically says if we want to meet our climate goals, we have to reduce our emissions in half every decade for forever. We also have to eliminate all land use emissions. And this blue line, we have to start cleaning up carbon from the atmosphere at a large scale. Where carbon capture fits into this picture is it helps us do that red line and that blue line much faster and much more cost effectively than we otherwise would be able to. Second piece is economics. That if we're gonna be able to capture and sequester, convert into valuable services, products, this carbon market, if you will, so not the regulatory carbon market, but an actual physical market for carbon-based products and services, it's gonna be enormous. And we've done some a uh, rough analysis that looks at what some of the overall markets are for carbon capture, as well as what we think some of the like serviceable markets where carbon utilizing products can compete. And the numbers are really large. This is talking about industrial transformation on a grand scale. And so we're just at the beginning of this journey and it's going to be a, a huge economic windfall for people who can figure out how to do this cost effectively. I think the other key piece about this is we're not talking about a small opportunity geographically. This is something that lots of different actors can take part in. This is just a map of the uh, 6,000 plus uh, point sources that the US government keeps track of in terms of carbon emissions. All of these could be a source for carbon capture and conversion. This is one of the more exciting developments to me is that we don't actually have to be tethered to an industrial facility to make carbon capture work. This is an actual direct air capture machine. It's no longer science fiction. Companies are building them. These are essentially carbon capture devices that can be sited anywhere that there is electricity and CO2, so everywhere. It could potentially revolutionize how we do manufacturing if we're able to bring down the cost of capture significantly. The last piece is that the activity is also well distributed geographically. This is a, a brief overview about where we have cataloged some of the startups, projects working in this space. Um, the team at Third Way, who's gonna present in a minute, has a much more, more detailed map, but the key takeaway here is that this really is a, a burgeoning field with a lot of activity beyond what um, we might already know. And I think even in the past six months or so, the amount of commercial traction in this space has changed considerably. That the XPRIZE was an early mover in this space. They have a $25 million innovation contest for converting carbon into valuable products. That launched maybe three or four years ago <coughs> and will award its finalists, um, if not late next year, then early 2020. But since then, we've seen startups actually get venture funding. Cement, plastics, chemical manufacturers, these are real companies that have attracted real venture dollars, not government grants. Government grants are a part of it, but these are, are real for-profit investments. One of the other things as it's given me the most hope in this space is that this is starting to break into the mainstream is you started to see the venture and the technology community embrace this. The startup accelerator Y Combinator recently announced a call for carbon negative startups, which is something that I think would have been completely off the radar even two years ago. 
the last piece is that the corporates are now also starting to think about this interface. The carpet manufacturer is a good example. They've committed to sequestering carbon in their products, their carpet tiles. They like to say if they can sequester carpet or carbon in carpet tiles, anyone can do it. And so I think this is just the beginning of a wave of commercial activity in the space. <coughs> okay. So on the policy side, there is an equal amount of uh, activity is starting to bubble up. And we're going to go into a lot more detail on this uh, during the panel discussion. But I think the biggest overall change is the 45Q tax credit. And many of the folks in this room have been instrumental in getting that across the finish line over the past six years or so. This is a production tax credit for carbon capture and storage. The outside world does not really understand that this exists. And if it does, the opportunity that it means. We have a lot of conversations with banks that would be interested in financing this. And this is really just the beginning of that 45Q tax credit getting socialized more broadly. But it's a potential sea change. In that tax credit, it's not just conventional carbon capture and storage, but CO2 use, both for oil production and in valuable products and services, as well as direct air capture that are included. So it really is a foundational piece of legislation for the full <coughs> suite of activities. What we've also seen in the past couple of years is an increase in the research budgets from the Department of, of Energy and beyond in this space. And we'll, we'll get into more details about that later in the panel too. But I think that's the sort of front end of the funnel. We need to get the research enterprise and that engine moving if we're going to get profitable businesses coming out the, the back end. And then the last piece is that there are a number of pieces of legislation currently moving. So the Use It Act, which incentivizes research and development and essentially task forces to build out infrastructure related to carbon capture through the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee has a decent chance of getting enacted by the Senate later this year and hopefully passed into law shortly thereafter. There also are a number of other bills, both in the House and the Senate, that would provide additional funding on the R&D side, as well as the, um, the general infrastructure planning piece as well. It's not just California where this is happening, that we're starting to see things percolate up around the world. Where we are in California, I think the biggest two pieces of, of legislation outside of the federal government, one is the low carbon fuel standard in California, which is trading at $150 a ton today, more or less, and is in the process of figuring out how to include carbon capture in that standard. $150 a ton is one of the highest carbon prices anywhere in the world. It would be really significant for this field. The other piece is the buy clean legislation that passed last year in California. This would essentially mandate the California state government to procure low carbon products. Expanding this to include carbon capture and storage, huge opportunity. And again, I think we're starting to see internationally that this is not just a US phenomenon. But we're moving first and fast here. That's going to have ripple effects around the world. Others are trying to catch up, notably Canada and a number of European countries thinking about funding their own pilots, small scale R&D projects too. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, the Use It Act is really um, the, the main piece of, of legislation moving here. We're going to go into a little more detail later on about what this is. I think the key takeaways, and we'll send this slide out later, is that this is focused on two parts. The first is funding innovation, direct air capture and carbon use. The second is on this infrastructure facilitation. A key piece of this bill is it's focused on EPA doing that research. So this is not a standard Department of Energy research bill. And I think that's a really important feature to show that this is a, an opportunity, not just in the energy sector, but <clears throat> beyond and thinking about carbon in a more holistic way. I know I went through that fairly quickly, 
let me pause here for any clarifying questions. And then we'll, we'll bring up the panelists to talk more. Yeah. On the last slide, the innovation uh, pride, um, where, where is that? Is that uh, accessible or is it sort of in design and development? And how, to, how would one participate in that? So the way that one would participate is if this bill gets enacted and turned into law. EPA is instructed to create the prize, and at that point, they will explain what the criteria are, how to apply to it, what the timelines are. None of that is specified in great detail in the legislation. Correct me if I'm wrong. You're right. They'll probably, we can chat about it more. They'll probably provide a little more guidance and report language for the bill, but it isn't like super spelled out at this point. Okay. If anyone's interested in innovation prizes, the America Competes Act uh, authorized basically any federal agency to do innovation contests. It's a great resource for how to design an innovation contest well, what has come in the past, what has worked well, what hasn't. So that's likely where that conversation will start. Yeah. Um, just to kind of Bring about a little bit of thought in, or more thought in this. Why go through EPA as opposed to DOE with regard to research and development? Um, DOE has had experience in kind of putting forward, you know, research and development projects for advanced energy technologies and everything. But and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think EPA is not as um, doesn't have as much experience as DOE does. So why go through EPA as opposed to DOE? So I think there are two main reasons. The first is it's really not an either or, but a yes and. EPA does have experience developing scrubbers, other pollution control technologies. They've leveraged that similar research infrastructure to not uh, figure out how to control point sources, but ambient air. So that, that's one piece of it. And uh, the second piece is that I, I think, sorry, EPA actually um, is well suited to collaborate with some of the other agencies <coughs> that there is no direct air capture expert agency that has deep research experience in this yet. It's just so new that nobody has it yet. And the hope is that this bill will engender this cross agency collaboration and help build that capability in multiple places. One other thing I flag about that and I'll go into No, no, go ahead. Um, in my remarks, but um, it's important who pushed this bill and what committee jurisdiction it goes through. So uh, this kept it, putting it EPA also means that it goes through EPW, which is where most of the members who wrote this bill are the committee that they're on and they're not on the energy committee. All right, so you know, with that, ladies and gentlemen, let me invite up the, the wonderful panelists. Aaron Burns from Third Way will uh, be giving us some remarks first. Um, Jeff Bobek from C2ES will follow and then David Babson from the Department of Energy slash Agriculture will we'll join. Do you all want to come join up here? Yeah. Let's give them a round of So as we're getting settled here, uh, so as we're getting settled here, what I'd like to do is actually get a sense of what your questions are for the panelists in advance. Do folks have things, I'll just take three one sentence questions in advance so we can get a, a flavor for what people are thinking about before the, the panelists get started. Anyone have things immediately on their mind that they're, they're curious about to hear more detail about? Let me add a qualifying thing to the criteria of the prize thing. I just looked up again. It does articulate 10,000 tons or more and $200 a ton. Or less. Or less, yeah. yeah. So there are goals like finite quantifiable goals attached to the EPA prize, but that's the only thing. Okay, thanks, Jane. Any immediate burning questions? Yeah. Carbon negative markets, like okay. turning carbon into X products, reselling it kind of thing, right? What is, what, what are they? Yeah, what are exactly. they? Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. Scalability and time frame. Scalability and time frame. Great. Right. <laughs> cool. Aaron. Cool. So Take us I'm, away. I am Erin Burns, um, and I talk about things other than the Use It Act. Um, 
So I'm a senior policy advisor at Third Way. For those of you who aren't familiar, Third Way is a DC-based think tank. We work on a bunch of different issues, but I'm on our clean energy program. Um, our clean energy program is totally climate driven, but we focus primarily on two technology, carbon capture and nuclear, and, and mostly advanced nuclear that we do for some existing stuff. So um, I manage our carbon capture work. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the policy, the, the current policy landscape and the opportunities that we have at the federal level. So we talked about the Use It Act already, so I'm going to, I'll run through this and then if we have more in-depth questions, but just to provide a little more detail. Um, so there are really three parts to this bill, as Noah mentioned. So there are two um, titles that you mentioned. There's the kind of innovation piece and then the infrastructure piece. I break it out because there are kind of two pieces to the, to the innovation title. Um, so the first, as mentioned, is a direct air capture prize. Um, so this is a $25 million prize. Um, as Janie mentioned, there are specific cost targets. Um, beyond that, they didn't provide a lot of detail as far as how to carry out the program, but I think typically what they'll do is work with the agency on that, provide a little more guidance, but they'll probably defer to EPA to some degree. Um, and so the other piece is on carbon use. So this authorizes up to $50 million for carbon use R&D. Um, right now, about 10 to 12 million annually um, goes into DOE. Um, it comes through uh, the Office of Fossil Energy at the Department of Energy um, towards carbon use right now. Um, this would obviously be a huge increase in the annual funding for it. Um, the third piece is the permitting improvement. So um, this piece was a little, I uh, got a little more attention. Um, it starts to look at it, the way I like to think of it is. I think it shifts our thinking on carbon capture generally. So this is not just about direct air capture. This is not just about use. This is carbon capture writ large. Um, so that's projects, that's pipelines, that's all of those technologies. Um, and I think that it helps shift our focus in a really positive way from this kind of project by project um, idea of carbon capture. We've got Future Gen and Kemper and Petronova um, instead to more of the 45Q vision, right? That, we put out policies and um, build the infrastructure we need to enable this kind of ecosystem of carbon capture to pop up, right? So let's build out the pipelines, let's provide the incentives, let's broadly enable carbon capture to, to be deployed. Um, so the other thing that's really significant about this bill isn't just that it provides money to some of these emerging technologies or you know, starts to look at the infrastructure questions around large scale carbon capture deployment, um, but it's actually the kind of political ecosystem um, that allowed this bill to move. So um, it was introduced, um, no mention that it's already passed out of committee. Um, it was introduced on March 22nd. They had a legislative hearing in mid-April, and it actually passed by voice vote out of EPW two months after introduction on May 22nd. And that's a big deal. That doesn't happen. You don't um, have bills typically move that quickly or any significant bills move that quickly through any committee and definitely not through EPW. Um, and so I think um, it really is representative of a larger opportunity we have on carbon capture and climate policy. Um, mm -hmm. And I think Noah mentioned that, that he's optimistic that it will pass this year. I think we are too. He's not the only one. And there's a quote from Amy Harder up here saying that while not a lot of bills pass or we don't expect a lot to pass, this one probably has the best chances of any of them, which is a big deal. Um, and the reason I think that is, and, and not to speak for Amy, but for us, is um, is really how the Use It Act came about. So the four lead sponsors on this, I mentioned they're on um, EPW, but um, or three of them are on EPW, are Senators Whitehouse, Senator Brasso, uh, Heitkamp, and uh, Capito. And these are the folks who came together originally around the Future Act, which was the bill that updated 45Q. Uh, I'm guessing most folks in this room are familiar with the mechanics, and if you're not, we can chat about it offline. Um, but I think, again, what the most significant thing potentially about that, uh, about the Future Act, isn't just the kind of actual substance of the legislation, but the process that they went through to get to where they, you know, to get this to actually pass. So, uh, this is something where they were drafting and redrafting and negotiating language and dealing with leadership. And and at the end of it, I mean, 45Q, we spent years and years working on this. It was a big deal. And at the end of it, immediately when it passes in February, they could have said, okay, cool, like we did the big thing for carbon capture. Please thank us, you know, spend this year thanking us in op-eds and events. But they didn't. They went and wrote the Use It Act. And they introduced it really quickly. And they moved it really quickly through EPW. 
Um, and I think that they're not going to, you know, if, if they weren't done after 45Q, I don't think they're done after the Use It Act either. So I think that that's a big part of the reason that a lot of us are very optimistic about this moving quickly. So we have this big opportunity right now, I think, to work on more legislation. Um, another bright spot that Noah mentioned um, is the budget. Um, so um, despite two years of the administration proposing gutting the Department of Energy, um, we got one of the best appropriation bills that we've seen in years. Um, every applied office got a significant increase, and that includes the Office of Fossil Energy, as you can see. Um, that's a pretty big number, and it's uh, a significant increase for the Office of Fossil Energy. It might be the highest number they've ever had. Um, and it's actually put us on target, this, the whole appropriations bill, not just the FE number, um, on target to meet our mission innovation goals to uh, double energy innovation funding. Um, while this is happening, there's also been, um, Noah had uh, a mention of the bill up in the House, but there's um, been an update to, or I'm sorry, been an effort to update FE's authorization. Um, so the bill in the House is bipartisan, it was recently introduced, BZ and McKinley. Um, but there have been other efforts as well. There have been some in the Senate. Um, there were some amendments to the energy bill that were really bipartisan. Um, the last administration also suggested um, updating the authorization for FE under something called ICCS or Innovation CPS. Um, and all of those efforts, I think the important part is all those efforts recognize that we need more money at FE, that we need clear support for later stage R&D, um, that we need things like large scale pilots, um, and that this is a technology that we need on multiple fuel types. So Noah mentioned the kind of old thinking about this being coal driven. That is, you know, still some of the language that's used, especially in a political way. Um, but a lot of these updates and authorizations, you see the need to focus on industrial capture, on natural gas, on direct air capture, and on use. And I think that's really important. Um, and I think that as advocates, advocates for carbon capture and use, um, we, um, this kind of this newer space on updating the authorization represents a big opportunity to influence this. You know, I don't think um, you know we like the the McKinley BZ bill. I don't know if it's going to actually pass this year, but I think it's something that even if it doesn't pass this year, they're going to keep introducing this. This is going to be something. This is going to be a space that we can uh, that we have an opportunity in. Um, and then the last thing I want to highlight is on the industry side. Now we mentioned we have a map. The colors mostly show up there, I think. Um, all right, I sent my slides very last minute. Um, so at the end of last year, we put together this carbon capture map. And for us, carbon capture means capture of power plants and on industrial facilities. It means BEX, its director capture is carbon use. Um, so all of those are up here. And there are certain things we learned when we put together the map that I think surprised us. And I'll say we're in the process of updating it, and it'll be even more accurate than it is right now. Um, and one of the things that surprised us the most was carbon use. And we found about 50 projects globally working on carbon use, and most of those are in the US. So I, I, yep, the vast majority of them are in the US. And some are really large, and they're companies that you've heard of. Some are run by grad students. Um, but all of them see this as an opportunity um, to make money, to build a business. Um, and so when we release the update uh, mid next month, uh, we actually expect to see even more projects um, up here on this map. Um, and really all of this, the movement on Use It Act, on 45Q, the support for well-funded FE, um, the activity that we see in the industry, I think it really, I, I can't overuse this word enough. It's, it's a huge opportunity for us as advocates, both on the climate and carbon capture side. Um, and I think that we have a responsibility to um, work with this burgeoning industry to connect, you know, the next generation of carbon capture advocates with policymakers. Um, Noah and I were in a meeting on the Hill earlier today, and I think you mentioned that we're all underwater with requests from the Hill on policy solutions and policy development. And I think especially making sure that this next stage, the director of capture folks, the next generation cap, the next generation point source capture folks, utilization folks are connected with those policymakers so we get the best possible policies enacted so that we can see um, this technology flourish is, is really our next responsibility. Awesome, thank you, Erin. I think I'm gonna ask Jeff to, to build on that and... Oh. 
<clears throat> well, uh, thank you. First of all, thank you to USCA and, and Heather. I work with actually, um, um, I'm Jeff Bobeck. I'm the director of energy policy at uh, C2ES, which is the Center for Climate Energy Solutions. Uh, now, the most important uh, word in our name, I think, is, is solutions. And uh, there are a lot of organizations that uh, have an interest in, in energy and in climate. And uh, we like to think that, that we really focus on the solution side. And one of the solutions that we are very strongly in favor of is, is carbon capture in, in many forms. Uh, C2ES, I, I wear two hats actually. I'm also co director of the Carbon Capture Coalition which uh, was born as NIORI, the National Enhanced Oil Recovery Initiative, seven years ago. And that is co-convened by our uh, C2ES and the Great Plains Institute. Now, let's talk about the coalition for a second. The, the coalition, when it was formed, was kind of an ad hoc coalition. It was aimed at one thing and one thing only, and that was passage of 45Q legislation. So we did our job so well, now we have nothing left to do, right? <laughs> well, that's only the start. And that's what we, we began to realize as time passed that, you know, now what? I mean, you know, if, if and when 45Q passes, or has passed, um, what else would be needed? Because a lot of people have told us, frankly, 45Q by itself is not sufficient to making carbon capture take off. And if I can, if I can deliver one message today, that is urgency. Again, we're, we're a climate organization. We believe if carbon capture is going to have an impact on climate, it needs to have that impact soon. It's not something we're going to be talking about in 50 years, probably. Uh, who knows what 50 years from now. But in the meantime, now is the time to strike. And that really is, is what has kept our coalition together and got us focused on things like the use of bill and the R&D bill and others. Now, let me say something about the use of bill. Um, you know, cynically, you could look at that bill and say, well, as Aaron said, uh, you know, it was only put together that way because of the jurisdictional interests of the committee. Um, well, maybe that's part of it. But the other part of it is, you know, it looks like uh, you know, it's pipelines and it's research you know, and a couple of different things. How do those things fit together? The fact is, they fit together very, very well. Um, research and development has, has grown by leaps and bounds in, in recent years. Uh, you know, I worked at the Department of Energy 10 years ago when uh, the government's FutureGen project. Anybody remember FutureGen? Uh, when when FutureGen was canceled, and that was the end of carbon capture as we knew it forever, right? Well, no wrong, because People started to realize there's something there. We can we can we can build a better mousetrap over time, but it does take time. And many of those technologies that, that you know that grown by fits and starts are, are really on the cusp right now. And so the, the decade of the 20s I'm going to declare as the carbon capture decade because you, you have the confluence of R&D financing, hopefully 45 Qs only at the beginning. And also, some coordinated public policy and getting back to the use of bill, that's what that's all about. Every state approaches uh, pipeline permitting in a different way. The government has, uh, the federal government has its own uh, pipeline permitting uh, rules. Um, what is important is for us to have some sort of a national policy, national plan for pipelines, for CO2 pipelines. You know, NOAA had a great. Uh, map up there with a lot of little you know, points of, of emission sources. Imagine if you could just take a big magic marker and start to draw those together. And that's effectively what a pipeline system would do. It would bring together the sources and hopefully you know, either transport that uh, the CO2 to the oil fields for, for the original type of uh, utilization, that's EOR, uh, but also for, for uh, smaller applications of utilization. Um, and so it really does start with pipelines and connecting, connecting the agencies to talk about pipelines, connecting the agencies to talk about research is critical. And again, 
It has to happen and now. Ten years from now, this won't matter as much because we'll already be behind. If you consider this, again, if you can consider carbon capture in all its forms to be a climate tool, um, we need to accelerate uh, the deployment because that's how we're going to catch up. If we don't have that, as many studies have shown, we're not going to get there just with renewables. And there, there are enormous, enormous business opportunities that Noah uh, mentioned. Um, you know, some, some people consider CO2 a pollutant. Uh, I think a lot of people in this room consider it a commodity. When they think of it, they, uh, they put a price on it. Uh, or they put a perspective, perspective price on it. CO2 as a commodity is, is, is a very important concept. And the last thing I want to talk about, again, our, back to our coalition. Yesterday we convened a work group of the Carbon Capture Coalition aimed solely at trying to understand a path forward for CO2 utilization. Now again, this is a group that started as just an enhanced, enhanced oil recovery group. Now, the interest is in broader and broader applications of, of CO2 utilization. And a number of you were in the room. I, I thought we had an excellent discussion. Uh, we didn't solve anything, but we certainly got some <coughs> great insight into where the future could lead us on utilization. And so I'll say it one more time because it bears repeating. Urgency. We need it. One thing that Aaron mentioned briefly that I had uh, is, is the bipartisanship on the Hill. There is bipartisan interest in this stuff right now. And Aaron, it was a great uh, description of the legislation. Every time Aaron does this, I learn a little bit. I think I know it until I hear it. Uh, but, but, you know, there is, there is such support for this. If, if that, ebbs away, we will, once again, we'll be behind. And my prediction of the 20s being the carbon capture decade will come true. So that's that's the thing. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. So we've heard about the policies, the politics, David Babson, and you share about what's actually happening on the, the R&D side. Sure. And I hope that this is the carbon capture decade as well. We can start early, it doesn't yeah. have to wait until <laughs> so I for New Year's Eve. Yeah. So um, I actually have prepared remarks. So I am from the government and um, I'm going to stay on script. Uh, so uh, first, thanks to NOAA and the Center for Carbon Removal for their continued efforts to advance policies and technologies um, that are necessary to realize a future new carbon economy. Um, thank you to the U.S. Uh, Energy uh, Association for hosting this event and Shannon. Um, I used to work with Shannon at the Department of Energy before she came here. It's good to see you again and, and thanks for organizing this. Um, Noah mentioned a little bit about my dual role, so I'll, I'll talk about that uh, to give you some background on on me and, and the perspective that I have. Um, I am currently the senior advisor to the chief scientist uh, for renewable energy, natural resources, and the environment at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, that is a position um, that is a politically appointed position for chief scientist. Um, but my role is a, as, as a detail lead. So the senior advisors are detailed subject matter experts from somewhere in the government or academia that serve for one to four years. And I'm on detail from uh, the Department of Energy. And I uh, work in the Bioenergy Technologies Office. And I maintain um, a 80-20 uh, split between USDA and DOE. So um, I, just as a note, to people that do this, it's actually a scam. This 80-20 split. Um, it's you know feels more like 100% USDA, and I feel far more entangled than 20% at DOE. But the work that I do at both places, and I work with um, uh, many individuals at, at both, is on developing technologies to um, realize this circular carbon economy. And so between USDA and DOE, we're actually this year going to be hosting uh, a, a summit, a Circular Carbon Economy Summit. Uh, and it is designed to um, identify what are the 
um, the challenges, the opportunities, and the research needs uh, for realizing a circular uh, carbon economy. So that's uh, your government is, is working with you. So uh, while today I will be wearing my USDA hat, I will note that my thoughts and perspectives are informed by both of my affiliations. So let me give you a little bit of context for how USDA approaches the, the challenges that we face and, and why we're interested in carbon utilization. Um, so the accumulation of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it can be measured. And we just recently crossed a troubling new threshold of uh, 400 parts per million in the atmosphere. That is bad. And uh, while it is unfortunate that I even need to repeat this, I find it uh, you know, useful sometimes for people to hear their, um, their government officials um, saying this. Um, and that is um, that there are you know, many lines of evidence that demonstrate that human activities, especially emissions from greenhouse gases, from fossil fuel combustion, deforestation, and land use change, are primarily responsible for climate changes observed in the industrial era, especially over the last six decades. Basically, this should not be a controversial statement that I am saying that climate change is real, it is caused by humans, um, and it is going to be potentially very dangerous, and damaging to our environment um, and to our economy. We need to do something about it. And one other thing I would say about USDA is that climate change is not abstract to USDA. We'll talk a lot about in the policy that we're going to talk about here. We talk about you know, carbon utilization. We talk about greenhouse gas emissions. We talk about the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. We talk about carbon utilization, that sort of thing. Um, and so unlike other federal departments, USDA's conversation about climate change is not limited to product carbon intensity and greenhouse gas reduction targets. We talk about those things too, right? Um, but it includes dealing with the very real impacts of climate change that we see every day. Uh, wildfires in our national forests, droughts, floods, crop failures, um, and extreme weather events are all issues that USDA employees deal with and respond to on an increasingly uh, common basis. But let me uh, also add some items that USDA has to consider beyond just the challenges of climate change. By 2050, uh, the global population will be nearing 10 billion people, and our ag systems will need to be able to provide food for all of them. Um, by 2030, an, an additional 100 million people will move from the lower to middle classes in India and China, and our ag systems will need to accommodate changing food demands with increased environmental and climate impacts. In fact, present estimates suggest that an additional 10 to the 9 hectares of land are going to be necessary to provide food for all of these trends. Um, and to give you just some you know, correlation of that 10 to the 9 hectares is 20% greater than the land area of Brazil. We don't have that land area. Um, and on top of all this, we need to leverage um, additional land and biomass resources to somehow manage carbon and address climate change. So these are the perspectives that USDA has when we approach this issue. So um, one of the things is it will not be possible to make the necessary changes that we need uh, making iterative improvements to the ag system and carbon-based economy that we have today. New technologies, out-of-the-box strategies, innovative policies, and different paradigms for framing our challenges and the solutions to them will be um, need to be simultaneously developed and implemented to realize a sustainable, circular carbon economy. Okay, so that's the full context from USDA. And you know, in part DOE, because I think about these challenges the same way. The Bioenergy Technologies Office that I work in, you know, works primarily on, you know, figuring out ways to generate and produce renewable fuels from renewable carbon, specifically from biomass. So land issues, ag issues are all things that they consider as well. Um, now I was asked today um, to talk about the proposed Use It Act. Um, and I think it's a great single step to help advance a set of necessary technologies needed to realize this vision of a new carbon economy. 
If implemented as proposed, the Use It Act will help to enable greater use and management of waste CO2 throughout the economy while establishing a new paradigm for valuing the importance of greater CO2 use and management. And I'm excited by the fact that the Use It Act would normalize the idea of management and carbon uh, removal, not just for the sake of cleaning up emissions from fossil fuel emitters, but for the sake of managing carbon on an economy-wide scale. Uh, particularly interesting is the direct air uh, capture language contained in the Use It Act. It is symbolic of a changing perception among pol politicians of both parties that there will be a future carbon management industry where there will be value in removing and managing carbon just for the purposes of managing and removing carbon. That will be its own industry. This acknowledgement has profound implications for how USDA, DOE, and other federal agencies will design and implement research programs going forward. Um, its very message will serve to justify a reframing of ongoing research and establishment of new research efforts across the government to promote the view that our national and engineered our, our natural and, e and in engineered ecosystems are inherently carbon cycling, cycling and carbon management systems. So, uh, with that background. I, you know, it's just a high level thing. I'm actually going to balance the time to answer questions, at which time I will not need to stay on script. So, <laughs> Thank <laughs> happy you, to talk about R&D and all the stuff that we're doing. Inside. Well, yeah, I'm going to go right back to you then with a, a more specific question. Sure. We've all talked about this huge portfolio of opportunities, both on the capture side and on utilization. You mentioned biological utilization. There are ways to make building materials, concrete, fuels chemicals, plastics, how do you start to think about prioritizing what still remain scarce resources when you think about R&D? Where are the biggest opportunities today in the portfolio that, that you're looking at? The, the most immediate opportunities that, that we're looking at are the opportunities to uh, utilize CO2 from the existing biorefining capacity we have in the United States. Uh, the, the United States produces 15 billion gallons of, of ethanol. Uh, and, you know, for every molecule of ethanol that's produced, a uh, molecule of CO2 is, is evolved from these biorefineries. Um, the, uh, a recent analysis that was done suggested that the 45Q uh, benefits could, right now, um, provide additional profits to those biorefineries by capturing and managing carbon. Um, so that is an area where we are looking right now to leverage um, the existing infrastructure that, that we have and the available tax credits that are, are out there um, to identify ways to actually increase the overall profitability of renewable fuel pathways and to substantially uh, improve their um, overall life cycle benefits. So where does all that go? Jeff, you mentioned pipelines before. Where, where do you see some of the early opportunities for that? utilization and or sequestration once we do capture it? It's a good question. Uh, again, I mentioned uh, the, the notion that the map you put up with all the, the separate uh, emission sources and pipelines are, are an issue in many states. Uh, we live in California now, and you know how tough it is to get a pipeline built. One thing about utilization is because you're probably talking about a smaller uh, volume CO2, you may be able to create uh, CO2 utilization uh, opportunities much closer to the uh, to the emission source without building uh, a 200 mile pipeline to the oil fields. They don't necessarily hand you a card that says how hard it is to build a pipeline when you, you move there. <laughs> right. <laughs> I do know what you're saying. Right. Exactly. Aaron, what are you seeing on the utilization and, and storage side, both on for carbon purposes as well as what are those economic opportunities? So, so I think that one of the things that we want to do is, you mentioned, you know, where are you going to build these or what are the pipeline challenges? I think that um, we don't necessarily have those answers and I think that they're kind of scattered about, right? Like the industry has some idea, like the, I think that, um, you know, the carbon use industry is, a, you mentioned kind of 
I think earlier too on one of your slides, it's a really broad set of players, right? I mean, some of these folks are, are small companies and maybe you're gonna use smaller amounts of CO2. Some of them can use like very significant amounts, um, you know, both industry-wide and, and as a, an individual project or company. Um, and so I think we wanna make sure that those folks are thinking about that long-term stuff, the pipeline stuff. I mean, I think on the pipeline side, there are places that we do have CO2 pipelines today, right? Texas and oil builds, um, if we're looking around the Lake Charles project in Louisiana, there are capture projects happening today that do require pipelines. And so I think there's some opportunities there. Um, and I think that you mentioned um, the other thing, XPRIZE, that one of the things about XPRIZE and their carbon XPRIZE that's really significant is to be successful and to move forward in that, um, in that competition, you have to have a business case. It's not just about, I was uh, talking to some of the folks there, and it was like, you know, can you actually make a business piece out of that? And so that's really baked in, and I think it's baked in for um, a lot of those companies. I mean, they're coming up with very minimal, there is some federal support, but relatively minimal federal support, but they're raising money. You mentioned there's venture money going into some of these newer projects. And so I think that all of that stuff is baked into a lot of their business models now, and we wanna make sure that what they're also considering is, what is scaling up as an industry look like in five or 10 or 15 years? And what are the policies you need for those, you know, how much pipeline do you need? Because I don't know that a lot of the companies necessarily have that answer. So I think for us, it's a big priority to get them here and, and talk to, you know, those LAs and those offices and to, to start to think about that policy long-term so that we aren't looking at, um, you know, getting that far along where they, they have this business case and they don't have the infrastructure yeah, can you share a little bit about the politics that you see and when you bring these companies into congressional offices, how that's received? Sure. So I think, um, so the USAID Act is really interesting. It's bipartisan and all that stuff. So historically, carbon capture is like uh, an issue has been something that whole state Democrats have, have championed. So for a long time, this was the, you know, Senator Burns and Rockefellers, and I'm a West Virginian, so that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, but you know, the Pennsylvania Democrats too, but those folks have been championing carbon capture and it was a big deal when we got Republicans super engaged. And it was a big deal when we had Senator Whitehouse come on board and on 45Q you had this like, you know, you had a really, really bipartisan group of members. And I think that with use, we have an additional opportunity on this kind of rebranding, on use and director capture and all these things. You have this opportunity for rebranding because Carbon capture is seen as this kind of, you know, old, stodgy technology, and it's expensive, and it doesn't matter if that's true or not. That's kind of what's been passed down to these sappers. And you come in and you say, actually, have you heard about, you can make um, this kind of a meeting yesterday, that there's a pair of tennis shoes, the, the shoes with no carbon footprint, that were made out of captured carbon dioxide. Like, that's cool. Like, you can come and say, you know, here's a product, like a physical product that you're making with captured CO2 and you've never heard about this. And it's and it's cool and it's new and that's nice and it's, you know, good, you know, comms and that sort of thing. But the other thing is that it doesn't have this um, pre they, they don't have any preconceived notions about it. You know, this isn't a Republican or Democrat thing. The director capture piece of the Use It Act um came from a bill that was originally introduced as a standalone bill just the director of capture piece from Barrasso and shots like i don't think they're on any other energy you know outside of carbon capture they're not on other energy and climate bills together and it isn't it's direct air capture so you're really you know i would think the main reason you do that is because you care about climate but i don't think that's Barrasso's motivation and so i think that that this offers an opportunity to kind of restart a conversation that's about carbon capture, that's also about climate and energy policy, um, because those are newer technologies that they don't have these, they don't already have these baked in ideas about. David, do you think these markets that we're talking about today are of a significant scale to have an impact both economy-wide on ag and energy systems, as well as on the climate, or are we gonna need new technologies in the future, and new markets to really hit scale? The, the, the markets are definitely big enough to accommodate a lot of this, but we need to develop the technologies to enable products directly from CO2 to fill into those markets. So, uh, for example, uh, biofuels, we, we need to decarbonize our, our fuel sector. Um, and, you know, I think we should electrify as many vehicles as we can, but we're still going to need, you know, a large amount of aviation fuels and marine fuels. 
Um, so how do we leverage our um, renewable power sector to, to provide uh, the carbon for the, uh, for the fuels that we use? One way is to do that is to develop technologies that allow us to reduce CO2 and synthesize fuels that are carbon based directly from CO2. The advantage of that will be um, it will bypass the need for land use to generate biomass, which will free up um, land that is going to be needed to manage carbon in other ways and provide food. But then it'll also directly use you know, CO2 and leverage the clean power sector to be the thing that you know, inputs the, the energy into the carbon bonds and the fuels. So there are huge markets available for all these things. We have the, the, the uh, scientific capability of doing those manipulations. Um, we need to um, invest in research that will drive down the cost of doing that conversion. And if that's the case, the markets are there. Um, the great thing about the, you know, all of the advances you guys made in, in terms of policy is that it's, it's changing the conversation that we're having, like doing R&D to say, okay, there's going to be a value on, on carbon in the future so that we don't have to just, you know, you know, rely on trying to generate products that compete directly with a dirtier alternative. So the fact that these policies, uh, you know, implicitly create kind of carbon prices and, and put value on, on carbon is driving those technologies. And if we can develop them, the markets are there. And Jeff, you hinted at this earlier that 45Q alone might not be enough to tip some of those products into these huge markets. What else do you see as some of the key pieces beyond things like the Use It Act and some of the bills that we discussed earlier? What are the other sets of incentives that we need to really make these market exactly. competitive? Yeah, exactly. Well, the one thing is we know 45Q uh, has, has a shelf life of 12 years. So anything that happens needs to happen fairly quickly. Um, if you look at individual states, uh, they're doing some interesting things that may change uh, landscape for carbon capture. Um, I'll, I'll mention one that we don't talk about too much in the carbon capture world. The state of Massachusetts this year changed its renewable portfolio standard to a clean energy standard, which includes nuclear and carbon capture. Now, I don't expect a, a major carbon capture project in Massachusetts anytime soon, but I sure would love to see other states adopt that language because it sends a signal to the market. If we, if we had uh, the, the large power purchasers going to their uh, public utility commissions and saying, you know, we seek to be 100% renewable, but in the meantime, we prefer uh, abated it sends a signal to the market. These are simple things that don't cost anything that are going to help push project developers, technology developers, and the finance community together. Aaron, are you seeing any political opportunities in some of those other policies now thinking beyond 2018 and which of these might have the most legs in this bipartisan sense? I don't know. I mean, I think that it's pretty open. I mean, I think beyond 2018, I mean, so I should mention we um, haven't brought up two different bills that have been around for a while, but they're also really important for carbon capture, which are private activity bonds um, and master limited um, partnerships. Um, and there's the MLP Act. Um, Senator Coons has had this for a long time. Um, the private activity bonds bill is a bipartisan and also really important for financing to make a big difference in carbon capture deployment broadly. Um, I do think um, that, um, you know, I mentioned that we got that, you made that comment that we're underwater with policy requests. I kind of think it's a bit of an open field. I mean, I think that's the question is for us connecting the next gen carbon capture folks with the policymakers to start having those conversations because I think that as a carbon capture coalition, I think we're a member, um, you know, we're really good at having those policymaker discussions and thinking about them, but like, you know, we also have to, to work with the industry to generate new ideas and I think that that's the stage that we're at, you know. Um, Jeff mentioned there was a, a carbon use meeting yesterday, and that's a lot of what it was, was kind of where are these, you know, where are the next policies that we need? Are we looking at 
you know, um, you know, federal buy clean standards or, you know, purchasing, um, using federal purchasing power to create a market for carbon use products or, um, you know, what is it that's beyond just our typical playbook or, you know, there are certain low hanging fruit, I think there's, you know, changing some definitions. Could you use the loan program, um, the loan guarantee program for carbon use? You know, is it, is it there for direct air capture? Um, you know, making changes to R&D stuff. I think that there are, you know, definitional changes. And 45Q, one of the important updates that was made was um, previously, so 45Q has been on the, the books for a while, but it was only, the only use that was accepted under 45Q was EOR. And one of the important changes was to open it up to other types of beneficial use. And so I think that there are some low hanging fruit that we can work on, you know, the next six to, to 12 months. But I think it's really, our next job is to work on find those kind of new policies because it is a really kind of open question, I think. Yeah, I would say actually, uh, extending onto that, uh, taking the policy, if you take, for example, the low carbon fuel standard policies that are that have been enacted in states like California and other places, um, those types of policies drive a lot of innovation in actually creating the types of, of products that you want, low carbon, products and so to extend on to your idea of you know perhaps having an advanced manufacturing standard that um, would you know basically create low carbon products standards would drive innovation in um, in two ways it would um, you know create the um, incentives for those uh, companies and individuals and researchers to, to develop uh, technologies to produce more products from from co2 um, directly, and once those uh, products are synthesized, uh, that itself is, you know, a form of, of carbon storage, and that can be fit nicely into, you know, achieving some broader um, climate goals. So, you know, rather than capturing CO2 and putting it under underground, we can actually store carbon in the things around us, and that would be incentivized through, you know, the same types of mechanisms that exist for low carbon fuel standards. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the thing is we know in a lot of ways how to help new technologies, right? We've commercialized lots of different types of new technology before. And so I think this will, you know, this carbon capture and, and use can be a little bit different at times and um, has unique challenges. But I think we know a lot of the types of, of policies we need. And I think making sure that um, they are, you know, also market driven. You mentioned, you know, how do you pick which technologies that you focus on because this is a really wide open field. I think for us in general, a lot of our policies look at how do you respond to market cues and, and what the company's already doing and making a business case because if we do have this problem, you know, future gems already been brought up. Um, you know, we don't want to necessarily put all of our hopes on one particular sector, one particular project. We want to enable this, this kind of industry to flourish. So those kind of market driven policies. Uh, that respond well to, to um, what's happening in the industry and using a lot of the stuff that we know works for other types of, of technology. I think that that's really useful. Karen mentioned appropriations earlier. Um, you see the, the disparity between the administration's requests and what Congress uh, rushed to approve. Um, no criticism of the administration, but having been in one of these administrations, um, the, Priorities uh, change with, with every change in, in, in the top, and so on the R&D side, that's that's deadly because you end up whipsawing, you know, back and forth between priorities, and every every new administration thinks they've thought of something the last one didn't. Guarantee again from my own personal experience, you know, they they haven't thought of something new, but again, Congress seems to get it, and, and in a bipartisan way. And it's not just the level of money, but, but uh, the, the way it's spent. And so staying the course uh, and seeing some of these technologies through uh, is, is so important right now. So if you have the Use It Act on one end, $75 million total in funding, future gen billions of dollars in funding, what, it, what really is significant as the next step in terms of, of funding in this space, especially on the R&D side? What are you looking for in terms of numbers to really catalyze this this field from Congress or beyond? At FE, I think at FE, Just I mean, across the DOE portfolio on these utilization approaches. Oh, on utilization. Yeah. 
so we'd like to see, I mean, there's been a significant increase. Uh, I mentioned, I have the slide up that like, we've gone up a pretty significant amount of the Office of Fossil Energy. Normally it's about 10 to 12 million there. Um, I think short term, we'd like to see, I don't know, maybe a tripling next year of that. Um, and then I think for us, honestly, we don't know, like we don't have the answer to that question of like, what does the industry need? And so that's why for us, one of the big next steps is connecting more concretely on what, you know, with the industry to say, you know, how much money is you guys need out there. But I think short term, like be a little bit ambitious, right? Good. Yeah. You know, triple or quadruple it. And I don't think that's, that's a far fetched idea. And you know, for technology across the board, there's, there's such a debate over uh, basic research versus uh, scale up or last mile uh, spending. And you know, it, we think you need funding at every level. You don't want to strand uh, technologies when they're just about to reach the commercial stage and then can't get any further. Yeah, and I think similar to your question about like what's the reaction about you know what's the political reaction on the hill to things like carbon use i think it's all still really positive with appropriations like you don't need a huge amount of money you know different programs and different offices can be controversial and you'll have amendments taken you know money from the ERE and the NFB and vice versa um, but i think that um, right now the benefit of use being a small number and being what it is is you don't have a lot of that controversy, right? They're going to fight over if you should just do coal at FE or not, right? Or if all carbon capture activities should be coal or, you know, where the lab should be or, you know, all of these other fights. And so it's easy right now for you used to go in and say, you know, give us 20 or $30 million more. And everyone's like, that's fine, whatever. We've got bigger fights to deal with, right? Yeah. It's a good place to be a lot of times, so. Is it going to be enough in the short term to, to catalyze the, the field, though? Or are we going to need to get to the place where? Yeah, this is very just like I think short. I think it's a combination from our perspective of getting a little more money into the industry that's already out there to show that Congress is paying attention. I think it's also to start to educate Congress. I mean, the Use It Act is awesome. I think most members, um, I, I guess, I guess they probably don't have a good sense of what carbon use is or if it's a real thing. There's definitely a lot of um, education to be done. Um, so I think that one way to do that they're busy people and if they have to talk about or vote on or discuss some sort of bill or appropriation like they're going to learn a little bit more about it so i think that it's starting to to familiarize them with this and, and the industry needs it let me pause here i'd love to open it up to the the audience and hear your questions before we we all wrap it up anyone have a uh, questions yeah would you state your your name too <coughs> uh my name's dan beaver so my question is, I'm not sure if this exists currently at, you know, Center for Carbon Removal, Third Way, uh, C2ES, or somewhere. Is there like a one-stop shop that shows the current and future prospective funding for, you know, carbon removal technology, uh, like, you know, prospective use it act, right? But like current, like here's like the uh, government organizations that would have like similar funding and like uh, other sources. Is there like a place do you mean over grant funding, investment funding, all of the above? All of the above, yeah, like the umbrella. We don't have that. Okay, I've seen it in bits and pieces. Ne never public sector, private sector, philanthropic sector. You can try and dig in, but it really depends on what specifically you need in terms of funding. I mean, that's you a great idea. Yeah, I mean, we're probably the right organization. So. Do you know of any government resource that would? compile all of those, those grants in that way? Like different stages as well, like, you know, R&D, stuff like that, anyway. There's, maybe we do keep track of the different, you know, funded programs that we have, but there's not been a good accounting of all of the overlap potentially across the government that's looking at this. Although luckily it's relatively small. Yeah, we did better this two was, years yeah. ago on bioenergy, <laughs> um, the, you know, folks that, you know, uh, did the review recommended that you know DOE and USDA do a bunch of things to prevent you know the significant amount of overlap that was going on. Um, in this particular case, we're doing a fairly good job of, of identifying and, and tracking the people that are working in this space because it's relatively small. Um, you know, both in fossil energy and the bioenergy technologies office, the folks at USDA, um, and we're kind of trying to bring all these people together at some of our summits. So. For now, we're able to kind of keep track of that, but I think developing a more formal system that lists all these things and identifies that will be necessary. But um, 
and it'll probably happen naturally as, as we you know develop and establish more robust roadmaps and research programs in this area. I don't think there's been a cross cut done by OMB in seven or eight years on this topic when they did it now very outdated it was low millions of dollars I know direct air capture again three million dollars in federal funding ever co2 use the budget this year was 12 million dollars that was a very large increase over six or seven last year so we're not talking very large numbers which is partially why yeah, in that particular case there are there is more money in that space that's not necessarily Exactly. listed as, as that in, in the budget. So for example, if there's no um, congressional language about the bioenergy technologies office doing CO2 utilization, but we invest millions of dollars into that, you know, just recently starting that up. So and these biorefinery projects are industrial carbon capture projects, not necessarily biogenic carbon capture projects. So the definitions are also not standardized yet. Understood. Yeah, and I think this is something I'll say that I mentioned the other technology we work on is advanced nuclear, and this is a challenge we've had with the advanced nuclear industry, where it's like, how do you even engage with the federal government if you're one of these developers? Like, they have to deal with a different regulatory thing, but on the funding side, like, it's such, I mean, it's a bit of a task. And if you're a small, you know, it's one thing if you're a big company with a government affairs team, it's another thing if you're a startup with, you know, four grad students and you're trying to navigate this whole thing. So it's something I, I know we think about, but um, yeah, I don't, I don't know of anything and, and something we haven't done. Can I plug Carbon Tech? Yeah, go so, ahead. So um, my name is Matthew Eschett. Uh, I'm one of the co founders of Air Miners, which is our. Uh, we're uh, making carbon sequestration more accessible for people by giving it a new name. Um, and Many Labs is an organization that's working with Carbon Tech Labs, um, and they have a great resource to uh, list of resources, including grants and accelerator programs, and they're dedicated to growing carbon removal technologies. Are you talking about Many Labs or Carbon Tech specifically? I think it's on the it's on the Many Labs website. Yeah, on the Many Labs website, and we're we're working with Carbon Tech Labs to um, help them succeed. So thank you. Yeah, so I'm happy to talk more about that. So, got a three guys located. We're in the Bay Area, but it's by coastal too. <laughs> You're here now. Yeah. We'll go in the back first, and we'll kind of work our way back around. All right. So Mike, go ahead. Mike Moore. Uh, good thought. We're um, when it comes to utilization of CO2, CO2 EOR. Right now, we're on track for the month of June to be exporting 2.3 million barrels a day of our production. So that would mean any additional production of any scale that we get from CO2 EOR will pretty much go to the export markets. Should we rebrand it as low carbon crude? Depends on the CO2 source. Well, well, we, we, we can track it. That's the, that's the easy part. But we're looking for ways to create a tug to pull more production from captured CO2. Since we're not going to use it domestically for the most part, since everything we're producing now forwards off for export, why don't we market a low carbon crude to a market to find could pay maybe a slight premium for that? Yeah, what are you all seeing in terms of the consumer acceptance of low carbon crude doesn't have quite the ring as solar fuels or something of that nature? Right? So are, are you well, seeing any no. consumer adoption or interest in this that idea? Well, again, consumers can sign up for renewables and all they have to do is check a box send it back and, and boom, they feel good about themselves and they, they own a wind farm off of Pennsylvania Turnpike. So, um, there is no way to connect consumers with, I shouldn't say no way, but there are not easy ways to connect consumers with carbon capture. Now, again, if we were to change language a little bit, get people to, to uh, prefer um, abated uh, fossil fuels, where that's available, um, it, it might change things. But, but the consumers, I don't think, have an ounce of knowledge of, about any of these. Yeah, I would say I don't think the consumers know that uh, much about the difference between low carbon petroleum fuels or you know bio-based fuels or renewable fuels or what have you. Um, one of the area, the ways I think that these products could come into the market, and it's a, that's why the 
low carbon fuel standard policy is so great is that it doesn't set you know all these you know restrictions on you know where the actual molecule of the fuel came from like the renewable fuel standard does um if you had a uh, you know a system that was taking co2 from a biorefinery or from a vex facility or you know a bioenergy facility and capturing that co2 and you use that for EOR, um, that, because it was biogenic CO2 that you're using and you're storing, um, the, you know, how you draw that life cycle could actually create a, a situation where you have a petroleum-based fuel, like the, the molecules in your finished fuel are from petroleum, but the overall uh, life cycle suggests that it's a carbon-negative fuel. Um, if you could get that, those types of pathways um, into like the low carbon fuel standard, I think that consumers would accept the fact that a fuel is low carbon, regardless of what, you know, the, where the molecules were derived. Yeah, the idea of an artisanal fuel has not yet made it to, mm -hmm. to sure. California. <laughs> and I brought that up because we, if we're, we're producing the crude domestic and we consume it domestic, then it's easy to connect those dots in a domestic market, create domestic buying programs. But since additional crude production is just definitely, just basically going out to the global markets, it's only for cash sales. You can't connect those dots very well unless you do some kind of offset inside the domestic markets. Uh, so we might add another 2 million barrels a day of CO2 EOR, but it's not for the US markets, it's just for cash sales. And so, but, Globally, there is an interest in, in a different kind of feed stream for, for crude supply. That's what Saudi Arabia is working on right now with their CO2 EOR projects in Altamia. These guys are trying to decarbonize. They're taking a certain amount of the carbon element out of the food chain of their, of their crude oil for exports. Maybe we do the same thing. And it creates a differentiation in terms of refineries' interest to purchase uh, first bid versus a second bid for something. Just thought. Yeah, you had a question there? That was actually kind of ties into my question. To what extent are you looking at um, what's going on internationally in terms of R&D for this type of technology? We're looking, there's just not that much. There's, okay. Overall, the U.S. just generally is the lion's share of the R&D in this space. There's a program in the U.K. focused on carbon negative technologies last year was about 10 million dollars i think they just increased it to 15 million so little trickles here and there there's some work in canada not that much compared to the amounts that we're talking about a so the initial programs here but also what could become if there were budget increases yeah and i'll say we typically work on about just like u.s federal policy we're not a, a huge shop uh but there are a few key places, uh, no which in Canada, but also Norway is doing a lot of carbon capture that's really interesting. And so obviously we work with them quite a bit in there. Um, that's everything. They kind of, I think, see in the same way we do to some extent where it's, you know, the point source stuff, but it's also direct air capture um, and some of those things. I mean, there's a, a few direct air capture projects globally, Iceland. Um, but yeah, and, and obviously the other thing that we look at for carbon capture generally and are starting to look at for some of the more cutting edge uses is some of the um, international financing mechanism. So it has been a couple of years, so I might get this actually wrong, so I apologize. But I think like with the Green Climate Fund, I think you can technically finance a carbon capture project with it. I think that there was, it was through the Green Climate Fund that there was originally like a um, Brazilian sugarcane capture project, um, for example, that didn't go forward. But some of those are already set up to, to help carbon capture. And I think especially for some of these lower capital projects, that are also not even directly tied to the fossil, which makes it a little easier politically, that you could see some, some opportunities to see those projects. But I think the last thing is on the international innovation ecosystem, it looks different. There are private sector companies, Covestro is a spinoff of, of Bayer in Germany. They fund a lot of early TRL research in this space subsidized heavily by the government, but it's not a government program in the same way that DOE or USDA would have. I think there was a question back here and then we'll come here. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the first one kind of runs with 
David, but it can be multiplied out. Um, from a policy perspective, given the uncertainty on tariffs for steel and um, the RFS and determining how much volume we're going to increase that or if it's going to stay, and then there being the main uh, area for biofuel development is in the Midwest. And where we're going to increasingly need energy is out to the coast. So we're going to have to build pipelines to market the CO2 availability out there. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty in that. We also need urgency. So is, is there really a good timeline to get that? Is that going to be a five-year thing? Is that going to be a 10-year thing to build pipelines from, you know, the Midwest to our coast where there, there's energy needed? And then with the low prices of LNG, is this actually something that, that is going to get continually funded? I mean, we're going to have, you know, increasing amounts of, of natural gas that are being produced at record levels in the future. Um, is that going to just outcompete any sort of carbon capture? We need carbon capture on those natural gas plants. Right. How far away is that technology? It exists. It exists. We on, have it like, today. But we just can't afford it. I mean, like at an affordable sure. scale. So right. I think just a clarification point too. I think we're talking about here CO2 pipelines. Mm -hmm. Right. Different than the oil pipelines. Right. So you're not necessarily shipping the energy carrier, you're shipping the waste products to the disposal place. Right. So not necessarily moving that CO2 to the coast. Is that where you're well, seeing some of those? those right. Routes? Well, you'd have to move it to like Texas where they are doing a lot of fracking, right? Or wherever you want to do your EOR. Also, there's a uh, 14 state governments have gotten together and created a state work group on, on this. And we're trying to, you know, on their own, rationalize uh, pipeline construction, permitting, uh, working together. Um, and so that's going to be very important to what I was calling you know, the magic marker and drawing the pipeline lines because, again, states have to work together on this. And if there's some national coordination of that, that, that will probably make it happen faster. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, where, 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 do you, where do you pipeline it to? If first and most obvious place is Permian Basin. Right. Uh, but again, a, a really well thought out map uh, has a lot more smaller pipelines, uh, small, and you're joining with bigger trunk lines. But the, the development of that is going to take 10 years, 15 years? Is that or not? Yeah. I'm just trying to think practically on, on, on the scaling of this. It doesn't seem like this is something that's going to happen in the next 10 years, maybe at the at the earliest. And so by then we're going to do electrifying in different ways, renewable energies, um, and which is the uncertainty. Your, your point's well taken, and that is the, the risk. Those 14 governors are dead serious, for starters. And then if you do get the Use It Act passed, where there will be a, some attempt at national coordination of the pipeline, um, network, you know, this could move move faster than that. The use the use of that could provide a lot of um, uh, could could answer a lot of those specific questions. Like, uh, uh, as he was mentioning, there are individual states that are coordinating on this, but coupled with the potential um, of the tax credits from 45Q, where we've seen that there are significant opportunities to build out an analysis of it been done to show that if uh, more available point source emitters were uh, taking advantage of the 45Q uh, tax credits, it would incentivize certain pipeline development. And then with the Use It Act, you know, the advisory committees that would be constructed would, you know, they would be tasked with looking at those, you know, regulatory, um, you know, components that would stand in the way of developing um, pipelines rapidly, and they would serve as kind of a, uh, you know, a central location that could do some planning on a national level that wasn't farmed out to, uh, you know, a few governors in a few states that are that are interested in this. That would actually um, be able to take a look at some of these big national maps that people have put up and identify uh, one unified strategy, or at least propose one strategy to build out uh, pipelines in an, in an efficient manner. So um, I agree. I'm also somewhat pessimistic, but I am certainly on board that it must happen much faster or we're going to be behind. Yeah, and I think that's something like we think about this a lot, right? The pipeline question is a big question and we talk about it a lot. And I think that's why you see it reflected in the Use It Act. I want to mention just two quick things. One, um, for us, um, 
So carbon capture, really important on, I you know I mentioned it typically gets talked about in the context of coal. I think the big potential for it isn't on coal plants. It's really on natural gas, um, on natural gas plants and on industrial facilities. So when we had our carbon capture map up there, most of the, the point source capture is, that's happening today is on industrial sources. Um, and that's gonna be true. So I think that's gonna continue to be the case. There's no other, you mentioned, um, you know, other renewable, like renewable energy options for the electricity sector. And we think that that'll continue to grow and we're really hopeful that it will. Um, industrial processes like production of cement and steel cannot at this moment be totally decarbonized through renewables. And so we're gonna need carbon capture. And um, the other thing is that on the pipeline stuff, it's not just about the EOR map. Saline storage is also really important. I mean, if you look at the storage map, it's much bigger. There are a lot of, USGS has done some great work mapping it. Um, you can see a lot of places where you wouldn't have to necessarily build multi-state pipelines. You could, you know, they're, they're pretty close to some of these, these projects. Um, and so, and I'll say for us, when we talk about carbon use, we don't include EOR. Um, we're just, that's not on our map. And that's all we, we focus on when we're talking about carbon legalization. Um, but I think that's a piece that gets left out too, is that, that storage piece is, you know, 45Q does make it feasible for a lot of these industrial projects to just straight up store it without selling it for, for EOR. Um, and so that's something that's important to consider when you're looking at the pipeline structure as well. Okay, so we had four questions, five questions. We'll get the queue. I think we had one back here in the middle, Donna, and then we'll, we'll come back around the big circle. All right, go ahead. Not to pile on, but the pipeline issue is, is just big, it's huge. Uh, the, for instance, the, the now canceled the Summit Energy Project was cited where it is because it was close to a pipeline. Uh, they couldn't put it somewhere else because the, uh, the added cost for pipeline would drive to make the project unaffordable. It costs, what, a million dollars a mile to build a CO2 pipeline. You can make CO2 capture cheaper, but you can't make CO2 pipeline cheaper. Uh, until there's a, 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 a transport infrastructure that's in place, you're just never going to make the progress you think you're going to be able to make in time. In time. Yeah. Is there another? I saw a hand in there. Chris. I was just going to offer a corollary to a question that was asked about international efforts. Um, no one mentioned Japan. Japan's done a lot of very significant work in terms of technology development. Um, the world's most advanced CO2 capture system was developed over a period of about 25 years by Japan's private sector. So Japan's a, Japan's a quiet but very significant player. John, did you have a question? Yes, I just wanted to share a different perspective on the low carbon crude comment. There's actually, from our perspective, there's no way to prove that it's actually low carbon crude because all the oil companies using CO2 for EOR outside of Occidental only have to report the amount of CO2 purchased and they don't, they have not opted into a leak detection program or any long-term monitoring to verify the carbon injected actually remains safely underground. So the nightmare scenario is that oil companies take advantage of the 4045Q credits, they deregulate the monitoring requirements, and then they attach slogans to the products. So that's just something to put out there in the world. Okay. Uh, I had a question about resources or databases that you might be able to point us to for best practices, i.e. lowest cost per ton for CO2 removal. It's a two-part question uh, being on the investor side of the equation here. The other side is highest value uses for CO2. So if you're interested in extracting it at the lowest cost from a point source and you're interested in using it in the highest possible value, what resources would you point us to? I'd have to think. Can I get your card out there? That's my own. Uh, me, me too. I actually yeah. read a, a paper recently on this, and I can send it to you that kind of looked at these sorts of things. It's challenging. We've been doing research in this area. I'm in mean, the venture capital world yeah. for investment opportunities that relate to cost, price, margin in between. It's, yeah. It's, it's, so there, there's no one place, and there's very limited. Uh, the low hanging fruit is the bioethanol refinery industry, then to some of the other heavy industrial sources, things like fertilizer production, other types of cement, steel manufacturing, those are, can be fairly pure. We'll presume that we've made an investment where we have the point source. Where you have the point source and you're looking for the technology to do the capture. Uh, and make money while doing it. Is the point source uh, a combustion unit? Yes. Okay, correct. 
That's bio, bio based. Oh, bio based. Oh, it's bio based. Bio though. genetic. Okay. But I mean, yeah, that does change the, the, the actual capture technology sure, that you sure, need to sure. employ. It's different yeah. for fermentation. Um, you know, because the pure CO2 streams that come from you know a fermentation unit are, sure. are obviously cheaper to, to deal with. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll get your card afterwards. Then. That'd be great. That'd be helpful. And on the use side too, I don't think that there is a comprehensive list of where to sell it <laughs> just yet. No. Yeah, I think that's why we're asking for your card is because none of us have the, there's no database that we can point you to or website, but we've got a bunch of like scattered information that we're happy to email you. That'd be terrific. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's one of these things that's dynamic. The, the thing that's not dynamic is if you, you know, store it because there's at least a fixed price on that. If you begin to start produce products from it, mm -hmm. then that you know, at the scale that you you know you know capture the CO two and be, begin to produce that product, then it changes that price. Okay, right? so if you have a very you know specific targeted product you produce, the the volume at which you produce it actually itself can change those prices, and and that's the real big challenge about a lot of the CO two utilization that the higher priced products that you can produce. Have limited markets, whereas the things that have really big markets, you need to produce really cheaply, like fuel. So that's a challenge. So we've heard greenhouses, this type of beverage carbonation. Again, you're talking on the order of thousands to tens of thousands of tons, several hundred dollars a ton they're willing to pay. Right. Once you try to go to Limited. oil recovery, Limited. millions of tons per year, that's down tens of dollars per ton. Right. And that's Third, another question over here, Matt. Um, I'm wondering about uh, the so your all these policy support requests. What opportunities are there for the private sector to get involved in helping write that policy, craft that policy? Um, That's a great timing of your question. Yeah. So um, on the carbon use side, I'll say um, we're doing a lot to try and connect the industry. We're um, it's not out yet, but we're going to be putting together some sort of process like that or some sort of event or, um, that I can chat with you um, afterwards about. But um, I think um, we are trying to figure out how to make those connections. I mentioned we work in advanced nuclear. We've seen that part of their challenge is getting smaller companies who don't have a huge government affairs team to be able to meet and connect with their you know, staff, the staffers for members who care about this issue or who represent the areas that they're located in. Um, and when you do, you get better policy, um, especially again to help some of these needs and technologies that they may don't they maybe don't have a lot of technical expertise on, or there's not a lot of easily available technical technical expertise for them. Um, so I'd say, first of all, if you're a company, like if you're state, if you're like in California or you're you know in Virginia or wherever you are on this coast, like you just call the office and ask for the member's name or the, the staffer's name, like they'll give it to you and they have standard email addresses and they will respond to your email, like if it's a constituent company. So um, I think we're trying to figure out the best processes to get some of those, the, the companies engaged. And so for us, part of it's direct outreach. We work with NOAA, who obviously um, works really directly with a lot of the, the nascent companies. Um, and so that's our next big challenge. I think we're employing a bunch of different tools, but it's something that Frankly, when we meet folks who have smaller businesses, we happily, you know, I'll give you the contact information for all those people, and they'd love to hear from you. Yeah, I mean, Aaron mentioned advanced nuclear. If you think about it, if, if you're interested in advanced nuclear, you're probably in the nuclear business. If you're interested in carbon capture, what business are you in? You'd be in a dozen different businesses at, at, at a dozen different levels. And so that's one of the uh, challenges for us is trying to figure out how to connect those very different interests, well, very different types of organizations that have common interests that may intersect. And that's frankly why 45 keep took so many years to, to get it written the way it was and get, and get it passed. And hopefully those dots are being connected. Uh, frankly, the, the funding from foundations like the Hewlett Foundation What's facilitating that? 
Yeah, just a, a fast comment. I'll go back on the pipeline thing real quick. The um, it's been it's been explored. The idea of going back to the Natural, Ask, Natural Gas Act and adding two or three words and the carbon dioxide would give a lot of the rights and dispensations that natural gas pipelines get for interstate build out storage facilities, rights of eminent domain, market based rates for things of that nature. Why not explore that? Um, you're looking at me and you shouldn't be because I'm not a pipeline expert. <laughs> um, <laughs> it is not something we, to, again, I mentioned we were relatively a small team. You're sure. Looking at vast majority of our carbon capture team right here. Um, so um, I know that's something that gets discussed in the carbon, you know, carbon capture discussions, like pipeline questions about that has come up. I think for us, I will say, while we don't, we are not a pipeline expert, um, when we think about it, I think we think about it from a couple perspectives. I mentioned that EOR isn't on the carbon use side. We do this from a climate perspective, and I think for us, it's a combination of um, the climate and the like environmental justice combination of how do you address those pipelines. I think that's important from for us for our values, but I think it's also important from a political perspective is to to go in. I mean, a lot of the members who've engaged in this engage in it from a climate perspective and sure. care about those things. So I think it's also having conversations um, with them to talk about what their priorities are and talk to those communities. I mentioned I'm from West Virginia and from the southern part of the state with a bunch of coal mines like. I, I think I have. I personally have a, a big stake in making sure it's done in a in a way that's helpful to communities. And so I think that all of those pieces get involved when you talk about it from a political side, um, as far as actually going in and talking about the, the kind of policy and, and what's most effective. One, one of these guys, if they want to. And, and Mike, who knows? Maybe it's one step at a time. If, if you start with you use it, which, as we've said a million times, had this enormous bipartisan support. I mean, it was the fastest um, uh, markup I've ever seen. It was 18 minutes and 12 of that was waiting for a quorum. But when you can get that kind of agreement on just studying the issue, um, maybe maybe the study two years hence comes up with that as, as, a, uh, as a conclusion. If, if you try and force the conclusion up front, I doubt that you get an 18 minute markup. Okay, we're going to conclude with a little lightning round here. Anyone, one sentence questions, I'll collect them all and we'll answer. Or I have one final question for the panel. Yeah. Um, I was interested in hearing a little bit more about the use of algae and its relation to carbon capture. Quick questions, Bioenergy Technology Office. <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> Uh, so we have an algae program that is looking at um, strategies to um, enhance direct air capture using algae systems. Um, algae biomass, uh, algae are a unique uh, eukaryotic microorganism with highly small lipid pathways. There's a lot of opportunities for them to, you know, provide displacements in the economy that are low carbon um, and while our research focus previously in the bioenergy technology has been on producing fuels from algae, we're actually beginning to look at other ways that they could be used in the economy um, to provide greater carbon benefits. So um, I'm happy to talk to you more about that. Other ways. Afterwards. Animal feed. Animal feed, um, uh, leveraging technologies so that they're actually um, used in soil amendments to increase human uh, compounds and soil carbon. There's lots of different ways that you can leverage algae biomass to manage carbon beyond just thinking about it as a way of displacing petroleum. I'm going to go start with you, David. One sentence, what are you most excited about in this space going forward? Uh, rewiring the bioeconomy, that is leveraging clean, cheap electrons to drive greater carbon utilization. Give you the semicolon there, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> I won't mention the company, but the game-changing uh, technology that may replace uh, uh, natural gas uh, emissions. Erin? Um, building on the momentum of 45Q to the next serious carbon capture and climate policy. One word. Thank you all. Let's give it a